Turn to Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. Last week we looked at Micah 5. Micah 5 is a little bit tedious. Would you agree with that? <laughs> as, you, as you go through there, it's kind of uh, takes, it takes a little bit of extra study, takes some deeper looks. Um, he begins by foretelling the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians and the scattering of the Jewish people. We call that the diaspora, as they, they scatter out across uh, the face of the globe, really. It, essentially, it, it started out as they, they scattered out into you know, points around Israel, but then as technology grew, I mean, there are, there are Jews in the far-flung reaches of the earth now because of what started with these prophecies of Micah. But Micah also prophesied the coming of the Messiah in Micah 5.2. Remember, he said that he would be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. And he talks about how the Jewish people would undergo great persecution and the scattering, but a remnant would return. And we may be seeing that right now. Remember 1948 when the Israel was declared a nation and the Jews have been coming since all the early 1900s, really, uh, they've, they've been pouring back into Israel. Uh, there are still more Jews in other places than there are in, in Israel. There are more Jews who live in New York City than live in Jerusalem. So the, the, the scatter is still very much a real thing, but they're, they're calling many of them home. So we might be, be seeing this, the remnant that returns, and then at Christ's second coming, they will accept him as Messiah. This is after the tribulation when there aren't really a whole lot of Jews left at the end of the tribulation. They'll have been, uh, been persecuted and martyred by the Antichrist and those who are part of his forces. And, and Jesus comes in at the last moment and saves Israel. Israel turns to him as the Messiah. They say, it's true. This is Jesus, the Christ. And, uh, and then Israel will take a place of prominence among the nations of the world during the millennium. And that's what is foretold in Micah chapter 5. In introducing Micah, though, if you remember back a few weeks ago, we talked about how on, on several occasions as you're going through the prophecies of Micah, you get the, the feeling, it's, it's almost laid out like a lawyer who's presenting his case in a courtroom. And that is exceptionally so here tonight. Tonight in Micah 6, if Micah 5 is kind of tedious and a little bit more difficult to understand... Micah 6 is the exact opposite, very easily understood with just a, a little bit of, of extra uh, attention, perhaps. Today in Micah 6, the appeal is from God, God himself, who's going to, to, to talk to his people who have repeatedly violated his commands. They, they've repeatedly, I mean, you think about the book of Judges. How many times just in the book of Judges did they offend and fall into judgment and then cry out for a deliverer only to be delivered in order to sin again. And they did that multiple times just in the book of Judges. And then you think about during the period of the kings, they had that happening. And then during, during all of Israel's history, it's been again and again and again and again. And God calls out to them uh, and he's, he's going to call them. He's, he's going to call them like you would call uh, on, on someone in court. And you'll see that in just a moment. In the last few chapters, Micah has prophesied of the future. He's prophesied of the near future. He's prophesied of the fall of Jerusalem. He's prophesied of the fall of Israel, uh, the northern kingdom. He's prophesied of things that now we look back on and we say that's history now. But then he also prophesies of things in the distant future, things that we look at and they're still unfulfilled prophecies, but they will be fulfilled. In chapter 6, Micah's message is a contemporary one. He's talking to the Jews who are alive right now. Hey, you who are here, listen up. I'm talking, to, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to a generation yet unborn. I'm not talking to a generation that has passed. I'm talking to the generation that is still living and is still rebelling against God. But he's calling on his neighbors to walk righteously before God. And it starts off with the calling of witnesses. Witness number one is called in verse one. God is talking. Okay, God is calling witnesses. Verse one. Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. 
Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. God is speaking figuratively here, because obviously the hills can't hear, right? He's, he's, using, he's using some personification here. He's saying, look, I'm calling the earth itself, the earth that has been here, you know, God created the heavens and the earth, and then he put people on it, okay, on the sixth day. So the earth has been here longer than people, and God calls out on the earth as his witness. He says, look, I'm calling the hills and the mountains for witnesses to what I'm saying to be true. This is an appeal to, to common knowledge, you could say. It, everybody knows it. Everybody, I'm, I, I, know, I know that the, the hills themselves, if they could speak, they would cry out and they would, they would admit this. So he cries out, cries out his first witness, the hills, the mountains, the foundations of the earth. He says, they'll back me up. Witness number two in verse three. Oh, my people. So who's he talking to? The Jews. Yep. Oh, my people. What have I done unto thee? Wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. Meaning, if you have a legitimate complaint, this is it. This is your time. You, you've got a chance. If you've got a problem, then speak up. Speak up right now. If, if, if I've done something, if there's wrongdoing that you feel like will stick, this is the time. Again, I, I've used recently the illustration when you go to a wedding uh, right before the, the pastor pronounces the couple, man and wife, he'll often say, if any man knows any reason why these two should not be joined in holy matrimony, let him speak now or forever hold his peace. That's what God is saying, essentially. Look, if you've got, if you feel like you have a legitimate gripe, now's the time. Bring it up. Let's, let's get it out in the open. Obviously, they're not going to have me, Okay. Because God starts laying out, he gives two specific examples, not of, of times when they should say, oh, well, God, he, he really gave us the short end of the stick here. God is going to give two instances in his defense. Look, here's two times when I, when I came through for you. Verse 4, for I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Israel spent 430 years in bondage in Egypt. It was bad. They were, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't working for low wages. It was working for no wages. They were building the treasure cities of the Pharaoh. They were, they were beaten. They were abused. And God delivered them out of that. After 430 years, he, he mercifully led them out victoriously. And it's, it's more than that. It's not that they slipped away. When we hear about uh, a slave escaping. It, it often happens in the middle of the night and they escape with the clothes on their back and maybe, you know, a little bag with some food in it. That's not how Israel left Egypt. It wasn't that way. They, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 36, we read, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required and they spoiled the Egyptians. Okay, so it's not that Israel slunk off in the middle of the night with the clothes on their backs. They walked out with the treasures of Egypt in their possession. And God says, I did that. I did that. You, you've, you've rebelled against me. You've continually and repeatedly and habitually gone into idolatry and you've rebelled against me. And you don't have any legitimate rights. Here's an instance of my goodness. How about the exodus? And God didn't send them out into the desert with no leader. There were, there were between two and four million of them who would have started wandering. God didn't send them out without a leader. He sent them with Moses and Aaron and Miriam. So he sent them with good leadership. Are these the mercies that Israel's angry about? Is, is, this, what, is this why you why you treat me like this? God essentially says. Example number two in verse five. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that he may know the righteousness of the Lord. If you go to Numbers 22, you find there the story of Balaam. Balaam was, was he a prophet? 
he, he, he was. He's called Balaam the prophet, and he did, did God speak to him? Yeah, absolutely God spoke to him. God, in, in famously, God used a donkey to speak to him in one instance. So, so God did speak to Balaam, but do you remember what happened? Uh, Israel was wandering. They were coming up, and they were preparing to enter into the land in that, in that era. And, and Moab had a king named Balak who he decided, well, I've got to figure out some way to get rid of these, these Jews, these, these Israelites. And so he found a prophet for hire named Balaam. And he said, hey, come here. I'm going to bring you up to a mountaintop. I want you to look on these people, and I want you to curse them. And so Balaam said, okay, I'm going to do whatever God says. So he went up on the mountaintop. And he blessed them. And Balak got upset. He said, he said, wait, wait, wait. I said curse them. You blessed them. Balaam said, well, hey, I told you I'm only going to say what God says. Balak says, hey, let's try another mountain. Maybe it was a geographical issue. So he takes him to another mountain. Balaam climbs up there. Guess what he did? He blessed him again. Right? And Balak was paying him for all of this. And Balak got upset with him. He said, look, what's the deal? You told me, uh, or, or I told you that, that if, if I pay you this, that, that you, can, you can curse them. And you keep blessing them. Stop it. And they, they try it again. And it just, it doesn't work out. And the, the story of Balaam, eventually Balaam tells Balak how he can, he can throw a stumbling stone into the, into the, to the path of the Israelites where God would curse them. You remember what he said? He said, look, here's what you do. You give your daughters to their sons and your sons to their daughters. Intermarry and introduce your gods to them. And you know, it's interesting that this comes up because why is Israel being judged in Micah? For idolatry. Right? Idolatry that started all the way back then. But every time that this happened uh, with the original trying to get them to curse, it didn't work out and he blessed them. And so God calls, calls this as an example. He says, look, the exodus, do you remember? Is that, why you, is that why you treat me like this? Do you remember what I did with Balaam? He tried to curse you and I turned his curse into a blessing multiple times. God's case has been made adequately. Does Israel have a leg to stand on in this courtroom? Do, have they, do they have a legitimate gripe? No. Could God give more instances of his goodness? Yeah. They, they start all, all in Genesis, and they go all the way up to the current day in Micah. So there's lots of examples. Well, Israel gets the message, and so they make a failed attempt at restitution. Israel stands convicted of unprovoked wrongdoing against the Lord, and so they, they're going to make an attempt to make it right. Okay? They're, usually, when you're standing in court as the defendant, do you get to speak up and say, look, here's what I'll do to fix all this. Is that usually how it goes? Mm -hmm. Never in any of the court things that I've been party to or seen, usually the judge says, but Israel stands up and they've got a bright idea. Hey, I know how we can make this right. This is... This is the child who shattered the windshield of the car coming to make it right with a handful of dandelions. Okay? Is it going to work? No, no. Look at verse 6. Wherewith, this is Israel talking. So we start in verses 1 through 5 with God talking. He's voicing, this is how it is. It's unjust how you have responded, how you've rebelled against me. Israel says in verse 6, wherewith, Shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Hey, hey, I know what let's do. Let's get back to the law of Moses. If we bring God animal sacrifices, it'll smooth everything over. Right? Hmm. Verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? That's a lot. They're, they're, they're making it big. Does, you know, let's, let's sacrifice all the animals. We're in trouble. Let's make it right. We'll give God everything. We'll give him all the animals. We'll give him thousands of rivers of oil. Then they raise the stakes here. <coughs> Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? They're offering to sacrifice their children? 
How does God feel about child sacrifice or human sacrifice in general? No, not ever. No, it's punishable by death. And you can read about it in Leviticus 18, 21, and 20, verses 2 through 5. Here, here's Deuteronomy 12, verse 31. This is what God says. They just came up with this idea. Hey, should, should we just haul for our firstborns? God says in Deuteronomy 12, 31, Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord which he hated have they done unto their gods, for even their sons and their daughters they burnt in the fire to their gods. God does not ever, under any circumstances, accept child or human sacrifice. God accepted one sacrifice for all time. That was the sacrifice of his son. Other than that, it was the blood of bulls and goats that provided an atonement. But to have this thought, for Israel to say, hey, should, should we offer thousands of rams and, and animals? Should we offer thousands of rivers of oil? Should we give our children? That just shows that they've missed the point entirely. They're not picking up. God has laid out his case, and it's very obvious. You've done me wrong. It shouldn't be like this. Here's what God requires. Verse 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. We're, we're going to get to this in just a couple weeks on Sunday evenings in our study of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Does Is God looking for them to sacrifice their children? No. Is God looking for them to sacrifice all of their animals? No. Is God looking for them to sacrifice their source of income, which would be the oil, the thousands of rivers of oil? Is God looking for them to sacrifice that? No. What is God looking for? Obedience. Obedience. He says, look, I'd rather have obedience than sacrifice. What exactly does God require? We have three things here in, in verse 8. As defined by a man who I've recommended to you named Feinberg in the Minor Prophets, to do justly, he defines as a strict adherence to that which is equitable in all dealings with our fellow men. Equity. Meaning legitimate equity, not the, not the term that gets thrown around right now in the news. Legitimately dealing well, to deal evenly with all men, not with respect of persons. To love mercy, a heart determined to do them good. And to walk humbly with thy God means a diligent care to live in close and intimate fellowship with God. What does God want most of all from his people? He wants a relationship. He, he wants them to do right and walk close to him. He doesn't want their kids in sacrifice. He doesn't want their material wealth. He doesn't want their flocks and herds. He wants obedience and that close relationship. There are those who would claim that this verse teaches salvation by works. That is not what this verse teaches at all and in any way. When it says, what does the Lord require of thee? It's, it's not talking about a means of getting a relationship with God. These actions should be the visible outcome of having a relationship with God. As we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This is not how you get saved. This, right? In Micah, Micah 6, 8, to, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. That's not how you get saved, but that's how saved people act. That's how people who want to have a relationship with God should act. God's laying this out for them. He starts off, he says, look, here, if you have an accusation, make it now. Certainly you're not upset with me because of the exodus and because of my provision for you there. Certainly you're not upset because I've, I've, I've turned curses into blessings for you on this occasion and many others. Israel says, well, what do you want? Should, should we sacrifice all of our animals? 
Should, should, we, should we sacrifice our kids? God says, no, I don't want you to do any of that. I want you to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with thy God. Israel's sins are then going to be enumerated here. They're, they're going to be laid out for us. Look at verse 9. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Ye hear the rod, and who hath appointed it? In verses 4 and 5, God gave instances of his goodness to Israel. In verses 10 and 12, uh, 10 through 12, God is going to give examples of their offenses. God said, you remember the Exodus? You remember Balaam? That's how I was good to you. Now he's going to say, and here's what you've done to me. Verse 10. Are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, and the scant measure that is abominable? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? What's it mean to have deceitful weights and unjust balances? Incorrect scale. Incorrect scale. The, the Bible says that, that a man who has two sets of weights is an abomination to the Lord. Why? Why is it such a big deal? It's cheating. It's lying. It's stealing. It's all of these things. God says, look, you're... You're robbing each other, and you're robbing others. You're cheating. You're, 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 you're being dishonest. You're not doing justly. Verse 12. For the rich, rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Those who, who accumulated their fortunes through cheating, if, if you had a butcher, and when you went in there, you saw he had his thumb on the scale... What would you think of it? Even if you had lots of money. <laughs> You'd think, I'm not going to this guy. He, he's gotten his wealth through, through nefarious means. They lied constantly to solidify their position as pillars of the community. And they dealt with violence against those under them. You try to point out their, their dishonesty, and they'll crush you. That's what's going on. And God's pointing that out. He says, look... I've been good to you. You've rebelled against me. Here are some examples of what's happened. What God accuses Israel of in verses 10 through 12 is the exact opposite of what he requires in verse 8. He says, do justly. <laughs> and they're using multiple weights and scales. He says, love mercy. And they're, they're using violence. He says, walk humbly with thy God. And they're seeking advancement in the community at the expense of others. And so to close out this courtroom scene that we have here in chapter 6, he's going to dole out punishment. Verse 13, appropriate punishment. He says, Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, in making thee desolate because of thy sins. God's going to give sickness, illness in their midst. Verse 14, Thou shalt eat and not be satisfied, and thy casting... Casting down shall be in the midst of thee, and thou shalt take hold, but, but not, shall not deliver. And that which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. They would have an inability to keep even what they got through dishonesty. You, you remember that passage in the Bible where it talks about getting wealth to put it into a bag full of holes? That's what God's going to do to them. He says, look, you're going to try to accumulate wealth, and I'm going to make it run away from you just as fast as you can bring it in. I'll have it going out the other direction. Verse 16. For the statutes of Omri are kept, and all the works of the house of Ahab. And ye walk in their counsels, that I should make thee a desolation, and the inhabitants thereof, and hissing. Therefore ye shall bear the reproach of my people. Who's Omri? Do you remember? He was one of the kings, one of the kings of Israel, up in the northern kingdom. Omri's reign is summarized for us in 1 Kings 16.25. It says, But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. For he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. He was a terrible man who, who just led Israel into deeper and deeper idolatry. And in Micah chapter 6, verse 16, God says, Hey, you're, you're still following Omri. You're still doing the things that he did. He mentions another name here. He says, In all the works of the house of Ahab. 
You remember Ahab, right? Good king, right? Great guy. No, you, you might know his wife better. Jezebel? She, she led everybody off into, into idolatry and into wickedness. She was the, one of the daughters of, of Sidon and Tyre. Uh, just a terrible person who led her husband into terrible things. Who led the nation of Israel into terrible things. Israel's unwillingness to turn their backs on the sins of their fathers would result in their destruction and in their dispersal. As we've already talked about, what we talked about last week and the week before. You've done all of this. You've, you've multiplied transgressions. You've multiplied rebellion. You keep rebelling against me. And as a result of that, I'm going to take you and I'm going to scatter you. I'm, you're going to go into captivity and from captivity it'll get worse. There will be a remnant, but that's all that will be left. Ultimately, there's no real silver lining to the dark cloud of sin, is there? We, sometimes we like to say, well, every dark cloud has a silver lining, but not this one. What, what's the silver lining? They're, they're gonna, most of them will die. As a result, they'll, they'll die quickly, they'll die violent deaths as a result of their sin. Sin brings judgment. What's God's desire? It, is God looking for extravagant and elaborate gestures? Is that what God's looking for? No. What's God looking for? Well, verse 8, he's looking for people who will do justly, who will love mercy, and who will, will walk humbly with their God. That's what God's looking for. Again, not in order to be saved, but because you are saved. If you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this verse, it would be a great thing for you to, to think every morning as you get ready to go out to work. You say, today, my goal is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God today. That's what I want to do. That's what God's looking for. God desires, he desires obedience more than he desire, desires elaborate gestures of, of sacrifice. What's the most effective evidence of a changed heart? A changed life, right? If somebody can say, oh, that, that's not how, you, they, they did you wrong years ago, and you find that you are in the position where you have to deal with them again, and they say, oh, I've changed, I'm not that person anymore. What are you looking for? More than their words, right? You're looking for, I, I'm going to be watching I've been burned with this before. I'm going to be watching this time. God's looking for a change of behavior. Not, not just the words that go along with it. God's looking for a genuine change of heart that will result in a change of life. Any thoughts or questions that you have here from Micah chapter 6? Like I said, a little bit more easily grasped than Micah chapter 5. Any thoughts that you have? Yeah. There was a man, I don't remember who it was, he said that if there was a histor if if God would allow a historian to have the benefit of living for thousands of years and just observing history, he says, I wonder if he would die of shock, monotony, or boredom. Because it really is just the same thing over and over and over again. The technology changes, and the people who are being affected might change, but it seems like we fall for the same thing every Every couple, every couple generations. What would fix it? Do justly, love mercy, all come be with your God. That would that would make a tremendous difference. Well, any other thoughts? Take a look over Nehemiah or, or over Micah chapter six again. Read over that. Next week, Lord willing, we'll finish up with our, our very quick run through Micah here. And again, my goal is that the next time somebody says, turn to Micah, you'll remember. I know a little bit about what he said. I remember he was a prophet who lived in Judah, 
who prophesied at the end, right before the, uh, he, he prophesied right at and during the time of the captivity of Israel. And he had a message that talked about serving a very big God. And that's exactly what we've seen as we've been going through here. So 